Yes, we're here again. Atlanta Discuss. We're here every week, every Friday, just to, you know, discuss discuss issues that are important, issues that are important to the world, to the continent, majorly to Africa. We have a very great interest in Nigeria. And Nigeria, you know why? Because Nigeria is the largest concentration of Black people on the planet. There are statistics that show that one out of every four Sub-Saharan African is in Nigeria. There are some statistics that also show that one out of every six black person in the whole world, including the Barack Obama, the Michelle Obama of this world, one out of every six is a Nigerian. So that means that the largest concentration of black people on the planet is Nigeria. So that's why today we're also going to talk about Nigeria. And we're talking about harnessing the power of the Nigerian diaspora contingent to fix Nigeria. And today we have another extraordinary yes, yes, extraordinary. Her name is Shiju Adewe. Shiju Adewe, welcome to Atlanta Discuss. Thank you so much for having me, sir. All right. So she's extraordinary. You'll soon find out why I say she's extraordinary. Well, just to let you know who she is, and you know, she's the founder of the Gilliam African Community. That's a G-O-C-O-F. She's a member of the We Can Sing, that's the CIC advisory committee. She was a counselor for Chatham Central Ward from 2019 to 2023, just last year. You can see she's fresh, plenty of knowledge, you know, counselor for that matter in the United Kingdom. Independent monitoring board for the HMP Stanford Hill, that was between 2012 and 2022. Shiju has shared the independent monitoring board for Her Majesty's Prison. Stanford Hill in two, from 2018 to 2019. Yeah, Nigeria did a lot of uh, reorganization in our prison system. Yeah, there's an asset for you there. You know, a statutory role by the Ministry of Justice where fairness is ensured for people in custody through active listening, investigation, complaints, and advocating for human rights solutions. Here you go. She's, she's, a, she's a lady for the job. Shiju has also been a speaker and campaigner for Aegis Trust and Volunteer Advocate for United Nations Association UK on genocide, mass atrocity, and UN resolution. She was a she was a UK coordinator for that uh, Bebe Heaven International, a non-governmental organization addressing women maternal L. Oh wow, that's interesting. She do has led local and national campaign issues featured on KMTV, BBC Radio Kent, BBC South is some of Shiju's advocacy involves road safety, flight tipping, drugs, gang, vulnerability, interventions for uh, young people, children's services, refugees, Black Lives Matter, education, criminal justice system, and research on impact of COVID-19 or BME community. Wow, overwhelming. Children's work in the community was recognized in 2019 by an invitation to the Queen's Garden Party by the Lord Lieutenant County of Kent. Discount the live CBO MBE, that's the name of the British Empire. Well, also representing Nigeria during the reading of the Commonwealth Chapter at the Lord Lieutenant Civic Service for Kent. Should you add you? Welcome to Atlanta Discuss. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so you see why I said she's an extraordinary guest, and uh, we have a lot to learn from her. She's going to be with us for the next hour there about. So let's keep the ground running like we always do, because here we just try and embrace the fact, to go for the facts. We bring everybody together and uh, we try and be honest as possible. We just search for the facts. And most importantly, we go for the juggler always. So I know you were a counselor between 2019 and 2023 for Chatham Centre. So can you please tell our viewers what you did during that time and what you're doing right now? And uh, then before we go to the next question, yes. Yeah. So, um... First of all, um, the Chatham Centre people, um, uh, I want to thank them for the time that I spent with them for the four-year term. You know, it was a great service to uh, to serve them. Um, I served on various committees um, where I was able to advocate uh, for the local people, um, what their issues are. So it varies from health, you know, so planning, um I mean, I sat on various boards across, you know, the council um, throughout that uh, four-year term. Also, a school governor for two primary schools, um, All Saints Primary School and New York Primary School. So, again, able to affect the education of our young people for that particular area. So, there were various activities, um, various policy changes that were made during that term. And uh, I would say one of my um, um, achievements would be 
uh, one of the, I think two of them you actually mentioned in the introduction would have been um, the vaccination to actually get our community, particularly the being Black, Asian, minority, minority ethnic um, community to actually get vaccinated because there were a lot of myths around getting vaccinated, whether we should or whether we shouldn't. And we needed to reach herd immunity because Kent, particularly Medway, was battered, you know, with COVID. It really ravaged our community. We lost so many people during that time. Our hospitals could not cope, you know, with the number of people um, that were, you know, diagnosed of COVID at the time when we had the pandemic. So it was important that we reach herd immunity and it was important that we get the education out there. So it was a privilege for me to actually spearhead, you know, that um, information, getting the information out there, the health education out there to get up to, for our people to actually understand um, the reasons for it and for us to get vaccinated. So that was one of them. Another one was during Black Lives Matter where, you know, um, where protesting, advocating for change. So one of the key things or one or two key things, you know, took place as a result of, of that protest, you know, because we needed to at the time and we needed our voice, voices to be heard because you, you and I know that there are, help, uh, there are inequalities, you know, systemic inequalities that happens, that takes place, that it really needs to change. So one of the things that we were able to change was to have Black history taught in schools, you know, so that was one of the key achievements that came out of that uh, movement. And I was also, you know, privileged to spearhead that. And also the other thing was we had a name, um, car park name change, you know, which was historic, you know, and it took us a lot, uh, sweat and blood to have that historical car park name change from a slave trader um, to, um, to what reflects the community today. You know, so those that, those two or three things, I would say that was one of the well, were the key achievements that I was able to you know achieve. Of course, not by myself. You know, with the team of people that I was surrounded with at that time. Interesting. Well, I like uh, anybody that listens to you. Know, you know what you're talking about, especially when you're talking about COVID, and you said we're working towards healing uh, hard immunity. That clearly shows. Yeah, you know what you're talking about. Well. Uh, you have succeeded in the UK. Nigeria needs you. The things are not going particularly very well. And as you know, we we want to see how we can unmask what the Nigerian diaspora contingent can help to fix Nigeria. Nigeria just had the presidential election. I mean, it's it's not. I mean, we're not happy about how it went. Uh, we are finding it very very hard to organize elections, even though we budget very high, humongous amount of money for this election. I mean, we're a country of 200 million people. India is 1.2 billion, the, the most populous democracy, even though it's a volatile country, no record of coup in India. And when they vote in India within 48 hours, everybody knows what the next prime minister or president will be. So that's so, so hard for us. So what have you on the last election? What do you think we can do? How can the Dara continue to help? You know, in this regard, we cannot organize elections. It's I know you are worried about it, but what do you think? The I was worried about it because I thought it would be a year. And I believe this time last year was when we were preparing for the election. And I spent the entire month of February doing five shows back to back, trying to get different political parties that will be um um representing in the election to try and get their members to try and come out and defend their party or why we should vote for them. And we spent that time during the entire month of February to actually help the particularly people in the diaspora to help them um, see um, what they can do um, to, shall I say, affect change with their loved ones back home because we knew we couldn't vote at all um, because the system of voting in the diaspora didn't um, hadn't taken place and it's still, you know, it's still out there, still in contention for whatever reason. But the piece that we can do here is to actually educate because the problem that I found, and I don't know whether it still exists, well, maybe we're getting rid of it bit by bit, was that people's votes were being bought. And it was important that we get the message across that sell your votes. And the only reason we were we will be able to, do, or how we will be able to do that was to get the um, diasporas here, their families here, to try and convince them that you don't need, you know, for your votes to be um, bought, 
you know, we really want change. You will need to depend on us as such. You have to be able to be independent enough to fend for yourself. You know, but when you have the right people in the country leading you, then we will need to do as much remittances as we are doing because practically mm. the people back home can actually stand on feet. They don't need to be crossing Tetra Sea um, to get to greener pastures, you know, risking their lives, the lives of their children to, just for greener pastures. So it's things like that that, you know, we need to get the strong message because the importance of having good leadership will actually, when it will start trickling down, that they don't need to make those dangerous journey or they won't need to be selling their votes or they won't need, you know, to be living hand, you know, uh, hand to hand, you know, begging, you know, the amount of begging as, you know, is notorious now on social media. Those things we need to curb, those things we need to eradicate, actually. So that's why it was important that we get that message across. Now, it was unfortunate, I would, should I say, unfortunate that I, I personally, I didn't think we had a great deal or a, a great pool of candidates, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But we have to work with what we've got. And again, I think it was over 100, on <laughs> how many candidates put themselves forward? I think they were shortlisted down to four or thereabouts. Um, but there were other parties that wanted to, you know, all kinds of parties springing up for whatever reason. You know, but we didn't have a great deal of, or should I say, caliber of candidates to make a good, informed decision from. So we had to work with what we've got. So I think it's very important for the audience to understand that, that we needed to work with what we had. You know, we didn't have the most ideal situation. Now, having said that, um, the four candidates that, were more dominant during that election. I know um, everybody had their favorites and they had their favorite to the point that it became more ethnic driven and more religious driven, which really defeats the purpose. And we needed to come away from that at, at the end of the day. Now, um, for me, what's important, and I'm sure there will, there will be few, few people that will agree with me, is that do any of those candidates have track record to lead the country? It's all well and good. That, okay, I can rise up today because I'm a millionaire or billionaire, which I wish. You know, I want to run for presidential, which you're going to come to about women in, <laughs> women in, uh, in politics. But if I have the money, should I just say I should rise up today and say that I want to run for election, people should vote for me? You have to question whether or not I am that person um, to be elected. Am I that candidate? Do I have the track record enough for you to elect me as your president? So those are the questions I felt so strongly that I needed to be put um, in, for, in, in front of people. And we weren't able to really answer that question. So I felt that the election was more or less driven by sentiments rather than track record of who can actually deal with the job at hand and who can um, actually deliver for the people. So, but for me, after the, um, when the result came, I personally, I know some people will not disagree with me, you know, that, you know, I think it was, for what it is, we, the outcome wasn't as bad as some, <laughs> I don't want to offend people, but as as bad as some you know um, some groups said it, you know you know so some groups would like it to be uh, if I if I'm making sense everybody had their party everybody had their sentiments and it was more or less I we you know and I know and I get where we're saying that we do not want to recycle the same old same old because that was um, again one of the strong narratives that drove the election about recycling the old. But then the new that were injected into the election, do they have the track records to lead the country? Where did they come from? How have they politically progressed to where they are? So that's why I said for what we had, for what it was, I think, it, you know, we had what we, <laughs> we, had what we got, <laughs> should I say. Let me yeah, quick follow up to some of the things you said. Let, let me try and speak for uh, some of the people that disagree with the polls. 
Okay, what they're saying is that uh, the budget for the election from the post of the government was roughly 400 billion naira, and there were monies gotten from the EU, America. Cumulatively, we're looking at about 450 billion. Now, more than 50% of that money was for technology, you know, Beavers and all of that. So half of 450 billion comes to about 225 billion naira, you understand? Yeah. So if we, if, even if we look at INEX own budget and all that, yeah. So they spend that much on technology. So we're going to get a lot of results in real time, a lot of results in real time. So what they told us is that according to INEC, you vote, you do this, everything is transmitted through the beavers, that the papers that are signed by agents, that it, those papers will be verified by what is on the beavers, you know, what is, it's going to be verified real time. So technology will be the basis for that election. Now, yes, yes. yes. That it has nothing to do with which party you support. It's just that let the money work, let the technology work. And if that mm -hmm. happened, nobody would dispute the outcome of the election. But that did not happen by 10 a.m. that day, the technology refused to work. And we have seen in cases like Rivers, Benway, and all that, where one person signed for everybody and all that. So in the past, the elections in Nigeria, according to those that don't support, and I think I agree with some of them, but the elections have been free, but never fair, you know? This time around, it was not free <laughs> and it wasn't fair. So, I mean, with all due respect to whatever the outcome is, that is what the argument really is. So that's why I asked the question that elections, I, I, uh, I, we, we cannot, I, yeah. I get that point where, you know, because in, in every election, we have to look at it, you know, for, from a pest analysis mm -hmm. in terms of political environment mm -hmm. and the rest of technology, mm -hmm. the rest, I get that. And um, technology really was the driving force so that we could have this free and fair election that is exactly. about time, the 21st century. I get that. But, and having spent so much money um, on technology to get that result, the unfortunate part, I, I, I feel, the unfortunate part is that was it tested? before it went live, you know, because of the population of Nigerians that, uh, or the number of people that, you know, the population of Nigeria, can the system, was the system built to cope with the number of people that were going to vote? That's the question. It should do, because that's why you spend the money for it. That's one on one part. The second part was, was it tested? Because with every technology, you have to test it, you know, um, and see whether or not does it work? What are the, um, would there be any feeding issues? Um, would there, you know, the, there has to be an impact assessment, whether, or, I mean, and I hope they've done an impact assessment actually out of this experience, you know, sit down, go back to drawing board. With every country, it's not just Nigeria, there will be glitches. Um, and it's important to actually take stock of what happened, what went wrong, what could we have done differently? I should hope that they've done that so that this same mistake will not be repeated at the next election. The problem that we have is that we don't we don't um, take stock. We don't document things as we should and actually sit down. What are the learning curves? Learn from it. You know, so I would, I would be interested to know that even with that scenario that you've just mentioned, what has been done about it? There should be a committee group to sit down to really consultants to really analyze what took place in that um, election and not just overlook it and just, oh, it was that, it was that. What can be done differently would be the way forward, I feel. Yeah, I agree with you. And the good thing about it is that that's why I'm talking to you, a diaspora, you've sat in government as, as a councillor. And I know that in the in the part of the world where you're in, if money has been budgeted for an election like that and the technology was not applied, somebody will be punished somehow. So I'm not holding brief for INEC. I cannot because I don't work. Somebody should be held responsible. There should be a scrutiny meetings, mm -hmm. committees. Um, there should be a meeting for elections. You know, who are the people responsible? They should sit in front of people. You know, nobody is above law. That's the beauty of this country, United Kingdom. Nobody is above law. Every member of parliament, either, and you know, whether you're a member of parliament nationally or your councillor at local government um, level, are held to scrutiny because you are public servants in public service. You know, you are being paid by the taxpayers and they will hold you accountable for every penny that was spent on the elections. So you, you won't go scot-free. 
you know, even with overspending, because there's there's strict rules around spending during elections, as you probably would be aware of. Uh-huh. And every party, yeah, even what you spend, you know, and there are periods during the election that you can spend certain amount of money. You know, and what you can do during what we call fodder. You might have heard it during the election. Because of, so there are countdown days towards the elections and there's strict rules of what can be done during those times, what can be done and what cannot be done during those um, countdown to the election. Wow. Well, thank you for that honest answer. Going for the juggler, I respect that a lot. The good thing is that even the Amazon Web Service, that warehouse, all this thing has told us there are no glitches. So let's go to the next question. Now, you live in the UK. Nigeria was colonized by the UK, which makes us a Commonwealth country, you know, and uh, there are a lot of people that blame whatever is happening in Nigeria today on colonialism. I mean, I don't fully subscribe to that. I think it's a failure of leadership. So my question is, should we still blame it on colonialism or what we have is a failure of leadership? What do you think? We need to move on. Honestly, we need to move on. I don't entertain such rhetoric, to be quite honest with you, because how long has the um, mm-hmm. independent 62, 60, how many years? Going to 64. <laughs> 63. <laughs> 64 years. So you want to tell me that you want to be blaming six decades, you know, um, if it was a human being, they would have had grandchildren by now. You know, you still want to blame mm-hmm. somebody uh, for, no, 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 no. You should have, you know, the prop, and I believe that there will be something else. We will always have a reason to blame somebody, somebody, you know, it's about our accountability, you know, and, and I think that's what's coming strong in our conversation so far about accountability. The moment we start being accountable for everything that we do, that we're not working for ourselves, we are working for the people, we'll begin to see a difference. The problem with Nigeria is there still aren't enough accountability, although they're saying now that with the new um, leadership in power, um, there have been some changes in way in which um, people, authorities are held accountable. Fine, fair enough. Let's give them a chance. It's only been a year. And hopefully we'll see that still to true. But again, it's about accountability and how we are held accountable, um, in, 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 my, in my honest opinion. So you agree with what the problem is failure of leadership? It's failure of leadership. It's failure of leadership. You've been handed down. So if you were handed down something, um, in 1960, was things bad when things were handed down? If you were handed down something and they left you with crap services, this is not work. It's different. Things were good when you were handed power. You wanted the power, you were given the power, which was rightfully yours. Do you get me? But what happens mm-hmm. subsequent leadership after leadership? People thought, oh, this looks good. I can have this for myself. I can have this for my family. I'm not thinking about why you are there was to serve the people, not just for your own, you know, because everybody, you know, were interested in having a piece of the national cake, you know, and how, and, and I think up until maybe the last five years, people started to wake up. But before then, I will have friends, I will be in conversation with people that they will tell me that if they ever get into power, they're only there to go and sort themselves out and sort their family out. And they weren't ashamed to make that statement because they believe wow. that if that person, yeah, because if that person has been able to do that successfully, it should be their turn to go and do the same. And that's how they saw presidential elections to be. And that's why we have anybody and just anybody saying that they want to be president without any track record. Because again, they want to go in there and have their own, you know, slice of the national cake, which is unfortunate. Sad, yeah, it's appalling. <laughs> actually, it's appalling. That's why I asked that question about election. You know, because if our if people's votes don't count and you elect the wrong people, nothing is really going to change at the end of the nothing day. Is- so that's why it works. Absolutely, but bear in mind as well that. Um, even saying that, depend on how bad things have been, 
will determine how long it will take to repair the damages that's been done. So we've got to give, we've got to look at it critically that, you know what, you know, because I'm not quick yet to judge the present government now. I still want to believe that, you know, they need time to see things filter through and to correct things. Time will tell after the end of the term whether or not things have worked or things hasn't, hadn't worked. And please, if it didn't work, put them out. That's what voting is about. But the votes don't come. Vote does count. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does count if you don't sell your vote. So I, mm. I've always said this, people keep putting it back to leadership. Mm. No, it's back in your power. The moment we start realizing that you run this country, not your leaders, I think when we have that paradigm shift, we'll begin to see a difference. That the power is really with you. I agree. Not with mm -hmm. People are saying. We've with said it here in our previous. Uh, mm -hmm. We've said it here in our previous programs that the office of the citizen is where the problem is, and that's also where the solution is. They that's have to rise up and live up to the village. Right. And then the demand yeah. for... So let me is... put this to you. Now, we're talking, yeah, announcing the power of the diaspora to fix Nigeria. How do you think, in your opinion, in your own words, how do you think the, the Nigerian diaspora contingent everywhere in the world can help fix all the issues we have in Nigeria? And let me just make one or two quick references. The Indians did it. The Indian diaspora did it with India. The Filipino that's what I did. It. I'm mentioning those two countries because they're in Asia. You can equate Asia with Africa in so many ways, you know, and some of them are even Commonwealth countries. So there's a lot to, you know, there's a lot to pick up from there. So, how do you think uh, the Nigerian diaspora continent can help? Okay. I was going to say during my tenure, we have um, a local community from Eastern Europe, uh, Bulgaria to be precise, where the, um, that community was actually voting locally in our local community to vote for something taking place in, in the EU. So it can happen. It's not difficult. So it's a case of mobilizing the people. You know, yes, there are, there are millions of people. We're scattered everywhere. You know, but there are factors that will impact that um, because a lot of our people, you know, if I, if I must say, are elusive wherever they are. So not everybody has regularized, you know, their, you know, um, papers, their documents, rights to remain their respective countries. Right. You know, so that has to be looked into as a great impact of how, whether or not this thing will work. Yes, we have the numbers, but we have the numbers in real time and you know politics is about numbers at the end of the day so you will look at it that oh because if, if we say now we will do diaspora voting it's been legislated the policies out there it's been legislated let um, let it begin at the end of the day the problem the problem you will have is that <laughs> you know whether or not you have the numbers is a different story because the number you will have um will be different to the number that actually voted. And then you will now say, oh, um, we have this X amount of people in the diaspora. Was there rigging? Because it doesn't reflect, the number of people that voted does not reflect the number of people that actually live, reside in that country. So you'll be wondering whether rigging took place or not. So we we must factor the, the um, that um, whether or not people have the documents, you know, because for you to verify, to be able to verify people, it, they must have the right papers, isn't it? You know, and you can't say you can skip that process because, because you want to know that each person's vote is legitimate at the end of the day. So you have to look, we have to really look into that area, whether or not can it work? And if it can work with, okay, with the numbers that we have, those people that are legal, those people that are registered, Let's let's go for it. At the end of the day, you can now take a um, poll from okay the people that registered to vote. This is how much. Uh, this is how the votes were being cast. We could work with that, you know, and see whether or not it works or not work. It, it will not work. 
there are, but I do think that, I mean, for even for undocumented people, irrespective of where they are domiciled, if they have a Nigerian passport, even if it has expired, you know, it should be enough to make them vote in an overseas no, ballot, you know, if you want that from it. I actually don't agree with that because I'm a person of rules mm -hmm. and I'm a regulation mm -hmm. that if you are not undocumented migrant and you don't have a valid identity to identify you where you are, really, you should not be participating in civil matters or civil. Get yourself, you know, get yourself documented, you know, because this is all part of what we're trying to correct. This is what we are trying to structure in place that if we say we give leeway to that, give leeway to that, that structure that we're craving for will fall apart. It won't happen. Mm. So we'll start putting serious structure in place that, no, there is no leeway for this. This is what we want to do. Let's get it sorted out the way it should be sorted out. Then it will start to be ingrained in people's mind that I need to do the right thing. Because what we yeah. work for at the end of the day is that right thing. And that's why you're voting in the diaspora in the first place. Shaken by example. Okay, so apart from diaspora voting, do you think there's any other way the Nigerian diaspora contingent can help fix the Nigerian problem? For example, I mean, I know there's a lot of criticism every now and then, but I'm, I, I don't really get to read position papers, for example, on, okay, the Minister of Finance, this is how you can tax people on telecommunication, this, you know, position papers from erudite scholars with the requisite knowledge, you know, maybe Nigerian lecturers in Harvard, Cambridge, or wherever come up with, okay, uh, we have five Nigerian uh, professors on communication in Harvard, this is a position paper on, you know, so what do you think? So apart from that, that's where I'm putting, how else can the diaspora could be that value? what you've just analyzed so let me go back to local government what happens here in the uk for every meeting that's been held in the name of local government either in um um ordinary committee meetings to actual full council meeting every aspect of the committee or of the council's business is documented there is a clock as well as in parliament you know nationally there is a clock sitting in parliament typing away what's being said so there is a record of every meeting that takes place. It's volumes and volumes and volumes and reams of papers. If you go to Parliament, I had the privilege to actually had a thorough tour of, um, tour of the Parliament. There are books, volumes of every motion, every detail of the meeting of the um, parliament, uh, Parliament's business documented, both in hard copy, because there's a library full of it, as well as online. People should be able to have access to this information, which goes back to what we are saying about accountability. Because you're put there by the public to serve, you know, so the public has the right to know. And there's something called right of information as the public, as, for example, as I am or anybody can say that. I think there was, I had two situations where I was sent an email that, um, asking, being notified, not asked, but being notified that a member of the public has requested for freedom of information, um, uh, information um, to about what happened, something I was involving, not just myself, but the entire council. So it's common that, you know, public can demand things like this. And if we can do that in Nigeria, every meeting that has been held is a doc, but they won't document it because they have things to cover. Because they want to, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we are moving on. So let me give benefit of the doubt that we are moving on. But until things like that is being done and, you know, put online and anybody can access it, we won't, we won't, we in the diaspora won't know what is going on. You know, there's a lot of things, as much as I'm in politics, there's a lot of things I'm still novice about, about Nigerian politics, because I know that I cannot enter Google and just put it in the search engine to find out this information. It's elusive. It's not right. But we need to get to that point where we will start having um, proper documentations of meetings that are taking place. Yes, I agree with you. I mean, we are doing even at our editorial level, we do 63, 64 years down the line. Those issues should not be a bone of contention, especially when there's internet everywhere. So now we both know that Nigeria is a bit unstable. There have been a lot of killings 
a lot of ethnic and tribal wars, religious war over the Christmas. Fulani headsmen killed a lot of people in Plateau State. There's always a case of killing. The law enforcement agency is helpless. Nobody really knows. And I've spoken to people like Professor DiCarlo, Professor Tommy, Pastor Itwa, a lot of all these scholars. And some of them believe that we need a constitutional amendment. They, some of them say that uh, the constitution we have today of Nigeria, on the first line, you see, we, the people of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and the argument is that there was never a time that we, the people, actually sat down to write a constitution. So they think we need to, to write a new constitution, that whatever we have today is not from the people. Uh, Professor Dekalu thinks the constitution, a new constitution really is not the problem, that we need to have a political agreement between all the ethnic nationalities. Do we really want to live together and all that, you know? Because at the end of the day, what we need is equity, justice, and fair play amongst all the ethnic nationalities. So my question really is that, do you think Nigeria needs a political solution, a new constitution, or in your own words, do you have any panacea solution to India Swimili? What do you think? In as much as um, there are um, gaps where we would need um, a new constitution, um, mm -hmm. I probably would not go for it in its entirety, simply because it will um, backdoor for a lot of agitation. As well, the agitation is already taking place, exactly. and what I fear is that if we say we write a new constitution, that will be the window opportunity for those agitators to successfully carry out. Well, whether or not they can successfully carry it out. It's another matter entirely. So that, you know, we can debate that. You know, it's neither here or there. But um, I'm not for the division. I'm not for, you know, each ethnic group, take your own part. I'm not for that. I'm for one Nigeria, which involves all ethnicity. But what we can do is not just write a whole entire new constitution. We can always make amendments. Because that's what happens here. There are law that goes back to how many centuries ago. But as time goes on, laws are amended to reflect the times that we're experiencing now. Again, when I told you about the car park name change that we had to do, it was an amendment, you know, that we had to do. There was even something else that we wanted to do that we wouldn't have been able to achieve because we would have had to go to parliament and change a whole you know, entire, you know, um, law that was made during Queen Victoria time, you know, which it's probably you, you would need a legal, a strong legal team to do that. Why would you even want to waste money to do that? It's another matter. Is it worth it? Whether or not that subject of debate again. But the point I'm trying to make is that we can always make amendments to existing policies, amendments to existing constitution. It's a matter of them debating it in parliament, um, in um, our House or Senate, you know, and see whether or not, you know, in the long run, whether it would be advantage um, to Nigeria, you know, because we have to look at it from not only short term, long term, you know, whatever changes that we're going to make, what is the impact in, in, in the long run? So a lot of these things we're talking about will probably require impact assessment where, you know, where things need to be thoroughly analyzed. Why are we doing what we're doing? Who will it affect? Why will it affect people and who will it affect? And in all that, you know, we can ensure equality as well as equity in the policy uh, making system. Yeah, I'm sure you know uh, Councillor Sonny Lambe. Yes, I do. Yes. Okay, I spoke to him yesterday. He was my guest, you know. So, mm -hmm. and he was of the fervent opinion that he's a Yoruba man, that Yoruba should succeed, that Nigeria cannot work. It was very absolute. It was very emphatic. He said the Nigerian project is dead. Nigerian project can not work. I'm. I'm I'm, I'm even putting it mildly, you know, and even on the screen, you know, he put his name and he said, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah. I mean, no, he took permission from me. I said, I don't have a problem with it. That we just go for the facts. So long, I mean, you're not propagating uh, war or something. He said, look, 
Nigeria will not work. Nigeria cannot work. 63 years down the line, there's no recipe for hope. Now, from where I'm sitting, I, I've looked at it that, yes, it's a bit difficult. There's really no equity. There's no fair play. And my reasons are also this. Four major mm -hmm. indices of a failed state. I don't think Nigeria is a failed state. I think it's weak. I think it's collapsing. But four major mm -hmm. indices of, of a failed state, or of a state that will fail or is collapsing or weak. The health system is non-existence in Nigeria. No water and all that. That's true. Security is non-existent. That's number two. The education system is in comatose. You understand? You can, apart from maybe the phone that is working, the GSM phone that works well, the Naira right now is about a thousand four hundred um, something to a dollar. So I checked it today. <laughs> it was a pound, um, so a pound to... 1,777 Naira. So exactly. we are close to 1,800. Wow. That's now, where we are. Going, yeah, where we're going is that bricklayers, yes. artisans from Togo, Benin, Ivory Coast, Ghana, they come to Nigeria to work because the Naira is, has more value than the Sefa. Now, a friend of mine, a lawyer, great guy, was a Benin Republican Togo the other day, and he said the Naira has less value than the Sefa. And within 48 hours, he even dropped more. Now, those artisans are going home. You know, during Mugabe, we were laugh while laughing at the Zimbabwean dollar. You know that, you know, I you all know the story of India, I mean, the, the Uganda <laughs> chilies and all that. Now, yes, yes. Nigeria economy today, we're using a very large chunk of all our income to service debt. It doesn't same things are going well, you know. So I'll ask you, what they have said, mm -hmm. everybody has said the diaspora contingent are the only ones that can rectify this problem. Do you think the Nigerian diaspora contingent domiciled in the UK, United States, strategically those two, have the United from have what it takes to help recalibrate Nigeria? I think so. I think so. I think that, um, that, we... one, that one auspices. You mean under which hospice? Is that what you're asking? Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. How? More like question. how? Question. Refresh your question. Let me understand it. Is there a coordinated effort? If there is none, how can it be coordinated? To ensure Nigeria. that we have Nigeria or yes, to have the considering the current situation, the forex, the bad health, <laughs> looking good at all. I think, I think, um, let's give the government a chance, the present government a chance. If it, okay. if, if, if it didn't perform, you can always put them out. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Um, but I think it's important that it goes beyond who is elected into the presidency. Because once they're in there, it's also who are the people appointed to this ministerial roles again is back to their experience their track record you know so as we're holding presidency um, accountable it trickles down to who the even the local chairman what track record do they have so that track record has to be demonstrated whatever tier of power um, you're holding so i think that we still need to look into properly who are the people appointed into these roles? So if you have um, a shabby minister of education, of course you're going to get poor education. Or a shabby minister of health, you're going to get poor health service. So we need to start looking into those portfolios. Who are responsible for those portfolios? What are they doing about the portfolio in their, you know, in their, uh, you know, the custodians of it? What are they doing with what's been um, held, kept in their hands? So again, it's back to how things are scrutinized, how people are held accountable. Again, we don't have structure for that. Had it been we have structure for that, all these things will be identified. You know, because for instance, when I was in local government, I was part of the adult um, social care and health, um, so health and adult social care committee, for instance. Now, in that committee meeting, there's only probably at the most approximately maybe 20 councillors 
out of the 55 councillors sitting in that committee, for instance. Now, in that meeting, we will have um, representation from that from our region. So, for instance, um, health-wise, who is in charge of um, the um, ambulance service? Who is in? Who is the CEO of um, our hospital? So, those key people will be sitting and meeting across us. We'll be holding them accountable as to what are they doing about um, um, our local hospital. Um, what you know, they will give us like you know monthly reports as to how they're delivering the services for the local people. So these are the jobs of the ministers that we are put. They're not there to just collect money, and you know, again, people go there to collect money to look after themselves and their family. So until they actually are doing the job in which they're being paid for, which is the public's money from the public purse, and being held accountable that, okay, as the Minister of Health, what hospitals are in your care? What clinics? How many doctors? Do you know how many doctors uh, are under you? Do you know how many nurses? I bet they can't tell you that. I bet they can't tell you that, which is quite sad. Or schools. The Minister of Education should know how many schools is in, is in his portfolio, whether primary, secondary, or at um, uh, university level. You know, how are you delivering to each um, sector, each service? So those are the key things. So it's not just at uh, national level, uh, presidency level. It's also how, you know, each tier of power, how each person, how each... Yeah. How is trickled down and how they're being held accountable and do they have the track record to do the job? Not because so you're my... Will they, how does the diaspora people come in? Do, do you have an idea of how they can help? They can help if they have the experiences. Some of them need to go back if that's their choice, yeah. you know. <laughs> because I know you're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I mean, it's it's a discourse where I'm I'm enjoying it. I, I mean, right. It was, but you have those people with those experiences. If they're willing to go back, if it's for them, you know, by all means, you know, they can influence change. I, I mean, I don't want to name a, uh, any political party, but there was a political party that I follow here in the UK, which is their chapter here in the UK, and the newly elected, what do you call it? would we call it president or coordinator for that chapter, was actually um, addressing the entire chapter and saying that what their party is hoping to do now is to have the, um, the UK chapter's voice in government. What would have been lovely that I would have loved to hear is it shouldn't be at party's level, but at diaspora's level. But every party is going in for their own, you know. So we probably we probably can guess which party is it because it's the reigning party, you know. Because that's the only way they can <laughs> that's the only way they can influence <laughs> influence what's going on because you know they're the ones in power. But they were looking at how that chapter would be able to influence things, you know. So they're thinking it's what they call thinking local, going global. So. In other words, you know, you you think local, you act globally, kind of thing. So that that was kind of the mindset that was um, that the coordinator was trying to drive at and trying to implement, which I think is great. But I don't think it should stop at party level. But I think it should go as far as okay, what are the Nigerian community here in the UK, for instance? How can they feed into what's going on in Nigeria? So they need to be work because we do have those um, groups set up as well. How, although, and I know they work with um, the high commissioner and stuff like that. You know, so these are the things that I think there should be more coordinated effort and not groups working in isolation, you know, until those groups start coming together, you know, as a multi-agency to actually now say that we should have this stakeholders meeting. So we're talking about the party, political parties, the high commissioner, um, the, the the Nigerian Community Association, or whatever you know, whatever they call. If all of them come together and work on a multi agency level to see what is it, how can we now feedback us from the UK? 
how can we now feed back to what's going on in Nigeria? And hopefully other countries can also replicate because it only takes one to be working and then replicate what's going, uh, going on here that has worked in other countries so that that voice can be fed into what's going on in Nigeria. I think that's what we are looking at it. That's a brilliant, very brilliant idea. The, the only issue I have with it is that I know a lot of a lot of diasporas have gone back, took back the politics, some won elections, some have been appointed. As a matter of fact, there was some data that we came across and looked into. We discovered that almost more than half of the current politicians have some semblance of diaspora in them. That is, they could have gone to school abroad, not really having dual citizenship, but they had some semblance of diaspora education. Now, from those diaspora that went home, some have done well, but that percentage is actually very negligible. The majority of them actually right. you know, joined the band work of yeah, which sometimes make it oh. hard to say that's where is the social. But let's go. I mean, we're pressed for time. I have just two questions for you. I I was going to ask you with your pedigree, your success. I mean, you are I'm sure you're a role model to a lot of younger girls and all that. Do you mentor younger people? Because I'm sure <laughs> that you you are you're, you're Africans in so many areas, you know. So it's always good to have younger girls place them and all that and do you and it's not it's not even gender based either woman men mm. whoever you are however you Fantastic. identify if Fantastic. you have the interest you know and that was even you know that was from the get go that it's important to pass the pattern it's mm. important to share what you it's important not to get keep you know what you know and think hard it for yourself because you're not doing mm. yourself any favors because we're looking at mm. you know a wider this is a wider strategy now that if I'm not doing it, you should be able to do it. So, you know, so I go into schools, you know, I have been invited to schools to speak about, you know, political, you know, political education and just, you know, participating in what we call citizenship classes. That's the subject here in the UK. So I have participated in those at Mental People 101 you know, outside, you know, the school system. So anybody that cares, you know, I do, I regularly do you know, live shows um, on my social media platforms to try and get those education out as well. You know, that what is really important, what we should really be focusing on, you know, and if there are things that people don't understand, it's an opportunity to ask questions. You know, um, I know a lot of people avoid politics altogether because of the jargons. Um, people don't understand how it works, you know, and we have different political system. For instance, you know, um, UK political system is different from Americans' uh, political system. And I think that's what Nigeria has adopted you know, which sometimes is quite difficult, you know, when we're explaining how political system works, um, because they've adopted the American system, but it's understanding how different nation, how their um, political system works, you know, around the world. And when we start doing that, you know, because our children, we don't know where, you know, things are going to take them, but life is going to take them. And I remember, I'll give you this quick story. Um, I, I had the privilege of meeting the former uh, president of New Zealand, Helen Clark, um, who was vying for um, United Nations General Secretary before Antonio Guterres um, got that position. And I had the privilege to meet her and I had a one-on-one -on -one with her where I questioned her that, okay, what advice would you give for anybody that would love to, you know, stand where you're standing today? Because you're president of a nation, or former president of a nation, you are now vying for one of the most powerful jobs in the world to be Secretary General uh, of United Nations. What can somebody do? She said it's simple, start young, start young, as early as she can st uh, start it. And there's reasons why she said that. She knew that it's not a sprint. It's a marathon to get to where okay. she is. And this is what I'm trying to say, that along the lines, you would have had to build yourself track record. Before I became local councillor, I was already active in the local community. So I didn't just suddenly woke up and say, oh, I want to be a political candidate today. No, I have been given my time my energy volunteering, you know, um, it wasn't paid. Good decade into voluntary service, serving the community. So it was no wonder that all that paved way for me. Do you see what I'm saying? So if you don't 
put in, you can't take out. And how are people going to trust you? You need to see what you have done before in order for them to trust you that you can actually do the job. And know that you are dependable, you're reliable. You can say what you deliver. You're not just in there for the fame of it, for the pecs of it, for the money, for whatever, whatever. You're actually there to serve the people and you're prepared to be held accountable. So we need to get to that point where right now, even my youngsters, you know, they're already active. You know, I talked about when we were doing the, um, um, putting the policy for Black History Month to be taught in schools. My daughter, I think, how old was she then? I can't remember, 13, 14. I can't remember. Put a um, public questions to our um, local government um, representatives, our councillors, you know, in full council meeting. That's what we are talking about. You know, letting our children be educated around. I know not everybody is passionate about politics. Fine, fair enough. But at least interest them. But then the parents are not interested. So why would the children be be interested? You know, <laughs> so people don't. Do you do you think do you think Nigeria should embrace the parliamentary system of government? I like this system. I understand the system, so I'm going to be biased. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I, I'm going to be biased. See, it goes back to them trying to get away from the colonial, you know, whatever that. I okay, we yeah. are independent mm. now. Think again, look at it. You've run away from everything, but you still haven't been able to gotten yourself together mm. with, with mm. all this. Mm. Do, do, do you know what I mean? So I love the UK mm. system. In the UK system works perfectly, you know, and I would love to see that replicated, but whether or not, but then that had took that has taken a number of years. So we've got to be mindful as well that where UK is today has taken years of consistency, years of accountability. Every time, every time public servants are held accountable until we give ourselves up to that, we will see change in Nigeria. Do you think it's time for a female president in Nigeria? There's, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I say yes, but then I want to say that I'm not, um, I believe that may the best person get the job. Do you see what I'm saying? But then I'm also mindful that we don't have enough equity for the best person to get the job, if you know what I mean. So if we that's have that's to, that's yeah. So if we have to um, do what they call, <laughs> I, I mean, we have to help the sisters along the way and give them the opportunity. But, you know, but then again, we're talking Nigeria, we're talking about cultural issues. There are people that still don't even accept women leadership in, in basic things of life, let alone to now rule, rule them, you know. <laughs> so I'm called upon. If you are called yeah. upon in any capacity, you know, mm -hmm. oh, Shiju, Councillor Shiju, Madam Shiju, people come knock your door now. Nigeria needs you in this capacity. I know you're already domiciled in the UK, you're doing a lot for the UK already, but you clearly have a lot. You you are you are a reservoir of knowledge, you yeah. Can you still serve it. Nigeria in any capacity? Yes or no? In this if current time, comes. if the opportunity comes, I have to, I have to, I have to think about it when, when that bridge comes. <laughs> okay, I think that and yes, <laughs> because it has not come, so that's why you're not saying anything. Okay, viewers, we'll be talking to the most indefatigable Shiju Adiwe. I told you she's an extraordinary guest. It's unfortunate we don't have to spend an hour, but I promise you, I'll bring her back. You know, I promise you. Shiju, thank you for coming to Atlanta Discuss. She brings, uh, she brings all the odds, climb all the odds. She doesn't take no for an answer. She slays stereotype. You find out where men cannot succeed, she does it. So that's why she fits our bill in here. I'm going to bring her back again. Thank you, Shiju. Thank you, our guests. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, seven thank continents of the world, Asia, Africa. You know, Europe, North America, South America, Australia, Antarctica, thank you for your loyalty. We're going to call it a wrap there. 
And I promise you next week, we're going to come up with another scintillating topic that will address something that's very important to us. Shiju, thank you once more for coming to Atlanta Discuss. Bye, everybody.